I was down with no way up and I needed some help. Everybody breathing but not living, just existing. Well, and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free.
Praise the Lord. Good morning. This is a day the Lord hath made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than be in the tents of the wicked. I don't know how your week has been. I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what you've been struggling with. But I will tell you there is a word from the Lord this morning that will bless you. Uh, I'm looking at getting my, my, my spirit, I've got to tell you guys this, I'm, I'm looking at getting my <clears throat> spirit calm because it seems like for the last three or four weeks I've had funerals, I've watched people, there were home goings and there were funerals, you, you do know the difference, right? Funeral is someone who is just going and we really have no idea whether they're going to glory with the Lord or where their final resting place is going to be, but a home going is going back with the Lord, and I watch this, and it seems like there's no end. So when I pray, let's pray about the reality of this life, that there is no such thing as being sure of what tomorrow is going to bring. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you this morning for the glory of another day. Lord, we are sure that you hold our future. We are sure that you are in control. We are sure, God, that you already have a plan. And someone who is going through and dealing with some struggles right now, God, send down a fresh anointing, Lord. Send down a fresh breath of the Holy Spirit into their place and let them get a reprieve. Let them get a moment of peace, Lord, because of your Spirit. Right now, God, I decrease and allow you to increase. Come, Holy Spirit, and preach your gospel. Amen. Go with me to the gospel of Luke. The gospel according to the writer Luke. Chapter 5. We're going to look at the gospel of Luke chapter 5. I'm going to be reading from the American Standard Version. Um, and I'm going to begin at verse 1. I'm going to read down 11 verses for your hearing today. Now it came to pass, while the multitude pressed upon him and heard the word of God, that he was standing by the lake Gennesaret. And he saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into the boats, one of the boats, which was Simon's. Stop right there, Simon Peter and asked him to put out a little from land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes out of the boat. And when he had stopped speaking, he said unto Simon, Put out into the deep, and let down your nets for a draw. And Simon answered and said, Master, we had toiled all night and took nothing. But at thy word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their nets were breaking, and they beckoned unto their partners in the other boat that they should come over and help them. And they came and filled both boats. So they began to sink. But Simon Peter, when he saw it, fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was amazed and all that were with him at the drought of fishes which they had taken. And so was James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, for henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left all and followed him. I'm going to tag the text that we have in front of us today the moment of time that we have with this fall. He is just getting started. He is just getting started. Reels, and that is R-E-L-L-Z, TV is an independent cable network that deals with or focuses in on celebrity culture. 
They deal with in-depth stories that tell how the celebrities rose to fame of infamous and famous Hollywood stars and even worldwide celebrities. One of their programs that caught my attention as I was going into this message is their TV program called The Price of Fame. This TV program, The Price of Fame, takes a look at the rocky, sometimes tumultuous road that people had to travel just to become stars. And as you look at this road that they had to travel, a lot of times it talks about the price that they paid and are still paying for the fame that they have. Some of the names that they've looked at so far is, or they're looking at some of the celebrity programs is Johnny Depp, um, Angelina Jolie, Patrick Swayze, Princess Diana, Prince, Robin Williams, Eddie Murphy, just to name a few. They're looking at their lives, and strangely enough, these stories seem to all be intertwined by some familiar issues. All of them had to deal with this. Turbulent family issues, substance abuse issues, mental health issues, um, legal issues, troubled relationships, and sometimes even untimely Deaths. These stories look at the rise and the fall of sometimes great stars. Most, uh, the most pre prevalent theme of these stars seems to be the one that we seem to can't wrap our heads around, and that is what constitutes a good life. Isn't it something with all that we've seen, with the stars we've seen crash and burn, we're still out there trying to get stuck, trying to get things. It seems like we haven't learned our lesson that we believe the good life consists of all of the stuff we can get and all the things we can get. And yet we see that these people who are rich and supposedly have everything they need are crashing and burning. We found out it doesn't make a difference how much money you have, how much talent you have. It doesn't make a difference how many things you have when it comes to the real important things in life. As a matter of fact, Solomon, the writer, says it like this in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 2, giving you the NIV version. Meaningless, meaningless. Everything is meaningless. It's all utterly meaningless. What is he saying? He goes on to say, none of these things can help you when you get to the real problems in life. Many of us can admit it. We have seen up close what happens to people who seemingly have all this stuff and still can't make it in life. We've watched in our own time the horrible deaths in life of people like Michael Jackson and Whitney Houston. And we've seen what happened with Robin Williams. We've seen what happened with Richard Pryor. We've seen what happened with Prince. We've seen these folks who had all and yet could not make it in life. And by the way, I am I'm excited about Bill Cosby not being locked up anymore, but I'll tell you, he has ruined his life. And how he has ruined his life, here are the things they do. They try to make money, please watch this, money is a resource, not a source. But they try to make money a source, and so they worship at the altar of trying to get more money, trying to get more riches. If I just had uh, a few more things, and the second thing they do now, only they want to make money a resource, they try to make things a God. You know, something that's going to help them. See, a uh, resource is not a source, but they try to make things. You know, if I just had a better house, if, if I just had another car, if I just had a little bit more, I'd be all right. If I had a little bit more jewelry, some more clothes, we get all this stuff. And these things just grow old and things can't help us when we really get in trouble. And finally, the worst one of all, they try to make people their hope in life. Oh, they run around, they grab people who have just as many problems as they do. They run around thinking about people. And what you need to understand is, for the most part, we're all jacked up in some kind of way. So another person is really dealing with their own problems. They really can't help you. So they wander around endlessly. Let's look at this text. This text is going to help us. They wander around endlessly on this journey trying to find better relationships. Just like uh, J-Lo. Uh, 
You know what I'm talking about. Jennifer Lopez. Jenny from around the way. Jenny from around the block. You know what I'm talking about. Jennifer Lopez who has gone from, or Jennifer Lopez who thought that her beauty and her body, which Jennifer has both, she thought her beauty and her body was going to be her ticket out. So she went from Ben Affleck to Mark Anthony to Rod to A-Rod and now back to Ben Affleck. She doesn't know what she wants and she's still running around. I need you to know there was a few dancers thrown in, background dancers, while she was going through these things. Proverbs 22 and 1 says, A good name is more to be had than riches. Here's our text. The only true source in life is God. When other sources are running out, God is just getting started. When your strength is gone, don't worry, God has more strength. When it looks like you can't find peace, God knows how to give you peace that has a death. I know someone knows what I'm talking about. God will give you peace in the middle of the worst situation. When it looks like you can't find a way out, don't worry, God has already been ahead of you and planned the way out. Many times when you're trying to get delivered, God already has made a way of deliverance, but we got to get our mind on understanding there's really only one source, and no matter how bad it is, don't quit. No matter how hard it is, don't give up. No matter what's going on, don't stop, because God into and released 
the superabundance of the over-the-top God. They turn on a God who's just getting started. Can I encourage you this morning to tell you God wants you to know what they had to find out. And that is when you're in the middle, when you're contemplating, when you're going down, when you're struggling, don't worry about a thing. You ran out, but he's just getting started. Come on, this is good. Let me share with you from this text. I'm a good Baptist preacher. I'm going to give you three points from the text, and we're going to look at the first one. The pitfalls of a shallow life. The pitfalls of a shallow life. It's right there in verse 1. And it came to pass as they, the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God as he stood at the lake. I want you to see this. It came to pass that all the people were clinging and pressing, trying to get to Jesus. And the Bible tells us to hear the word of God, but not only to hear the word of God. That was not their primary reason, and that was the problem. The reason they were there is explained in chapter 4, the chapter that precedes this chapter. You know where we are right now, right? Because in this chapter, we're looking at the fact that Jesus has just left out of Galilee, just been baptized by John the Baptist. He went into the wilderness in chapter 4, and there he was tempted of the devil. And that's where he said, it is written, it is written. But the Bible says, when he came out of that, when he came out of that wilderness, he came out with power. He came anointed with power. There's something, when you stand on the Word of God, I'm just throwing this in for free. When you stand on the Word of God, even though you're not asking for power, God knows how to get power. There's somebody to tell you, they read a word. They don't know how that word did what it did but when I read the word, because the word has a life all in itself. Did you know that God's word gives birth? So when you speak it, it is alive. It is pregnant with anointing and power from God. So while you're sitting there dying, you should be speaking a word so that you can birth your deliverance. When you speak God's word, the seed that goes into your heart sends your spirit man into another area of development and you find yourself stronger and better than you were before. And after Jesus came out and said he went into Galilee, and there when he got into Galilee, as he went through with the power, he went to Nazareth, going through his hometown. And there in Nazareth, as was his custom, he picked up the book and he read in the book, Luke 4, 18, you know the text, that said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. The Bible says that in this fourth chapter, he went and healed Peter's mother-in-law. He cast out a demon, told the demons to shut up. The demons called him by name. Then it said many sick folk were brought to him. He healed every one of the sick folk. And then not only did he heal every one of the sick folk, the Bible said, and his fame went abroad everywhere. And not only did he heal them, but he cast out all kinds of demons whenever anyone came unto him. And all of these people heard this, and they were running around, and, and they wanted to see what Jesus was doing as his fame went out. They were chasing after him because they had never heard anybody claim that today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. That's different, Jesus. How are you saying today? That's the problem. In Nazareth, he could not, after all the lessons he did, he could not heal but a few sick folk. And the reason he could not heal them is because they were walking around in unbelief. They were walking around too familiar with God. It's a shame when you're walking around this close to God's power, but you're so familiar, you're so set in your ways that you know what God is going to do, that you can't access the power of God. God wants to do a new thing, but you are so serene, so settled, in set thinking you know God could be doing a new miracle because you won't loosen up and let him in and let him do it. You wouldn't even believe it if he gave you what you asked for him to give you. The Bible says that they were sitting there and they said, isn't this Mary's son? Don't we know his brother Joseph? And they were sitting there because they had never heard it. And it's just like 
some people sitting and listening to me and sitting in the sanctuary and sitting in your house wherever you are. Some of you, the only reason you have got, not gotten your blessing is you're so familiar with God that you've gotten to this place, this pseudo place where we do the church thing, but the church thing is just here so I can wait and try to get my stuff. But I'm so familiar with how far God can go and what he can't do that I sit there sometimes and let my blessing pass me by out of unbelief. God, I know you can do that, but I don't really believe you can do that. We shout, but we don't believe. Sometimes we pray. God's ready to answer the prayer, but we don't believe. Sometimes we ask God for stuff. We're not still around when he wants to give it to us. And because we can pray and not believe God, what happens is the blessings in our heart are not able to unleash the God of superabundance. What am I saying? There was a bar that was being renovated in a Texas town. And it was going to be built right across from the church. And so the church went into prayer to make sure this bar was not going to be renovated and built. But the work went on. The work went on and they kept praying. The work went on and they kept praying. And as they were praying, as the work went on, a lightning storm came the day before the bar was to open. And the bar was hit by lightning and burned down. And the church rejoiced and they rejoiced until they got the legal notice. The bar owner was suing the church for directly or indirectly through their prayers destroying his place of business. So he got his legal attorneys together and that's what he took into the courtroom. But the church also got their lawyers. And their lawyers stood up and they wrote a brief and in their brief they said, we are no one responsible for what happened to that bar. And so the day of court came and the judge got to play the papers before him and he looked over the case and the judge looked up and said, well, I don't know how I'm going to roll, but I want to tell you one thing that's very clear. It seems like the bar owner believes in prayer and this whole congregation of church folk don't. Understand? We get put on cruise control and we're sitting there praying stuff we don't even believe. Because God wants to do something different in our life. Let's look at the pitfalls of a shallow life. This text is in line with what Dr. Luke wanted to say about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Each one of the gospel writers wrote a different theme and a message they wanted to say about the good news of Jesus. For instance, Mark's gospel was written to the Greek Jews to let them know that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, which means anointed one. So Jesus was the anointed one, and Mark wanted them to know that he is now, he was the king of the Jews. The Messiah had come. Mark's gospel, um, that was Matthew's gospel, Mark's gospel wanted to write that Jesus was uh a miracle worker. He concentrated on the things Jesus did and not on the things Jesus said. So Mark's gospel was written to the Romans and what he wanted the Romans to see that God had power because that's all they believed in. John's gospel was written to show that Jesus Christ was God. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was God. He wanted to show that Jesus was in fact, God. So Matthew wanted to show that he was king. Mark wanted to show that he had miracle power. And John wanted to show that he was the king, that he was God. And in this gospel, Luke wanted to show to all believers that you can believe everything God said and it is true. You've heard about it, but now it's time for you to act on it. Oh, I got to stop right there. You've heard it, but tonight it's time for you. To, today it's time for you to act on what you've heard. So what we need to understand as we look at this text, it says, And Jesus came and saw a few fishermen washing their nets. Wow. They were washing their nets their 
nets they were about to quit and so the crowds were pressing on Jesus I told you they were there to see what they could get not just to learn who God was but they were watching it as they were about to give up so Jesus looked at their boats and he told them press out a little bit on the shore Jesus was smart what he decided to do was to get a little bit into the shallow water so he could preach the gospel unto them because there was too many people chasing after him but what I need you to see is he got to Peter's boat now you need to know he has not chosen his disciples yet but I need you to know there's no accident that Jesus had chosen Peter's boat because this is interesting what Luke wanted us to see that God had not recruited Simon Peter and John and James but this was the recruitment and the call he's walking us through the gospel to let us see that God already knew he saw Peter washing his boats can you go with me he saw three disciples washing their boats washing is he saw their lives he saw them about to give up he saw them washing their boats throwing in the towel and he knew that if they stay like that and he wanted them to have the abundance life that he had for them. So what he had to do was he called them even though they were giving up, even though they were washing their boats. No, I haven't made it plain enough. What I'm saying is God called us right in the middle of us walking around with a, with a substandard power. He called us when he saw us washing our nets. He saw us resolve to live the kind of life we were living. He saw the things that had us hindered. He saw the stuff we were in. Somebody ought to admit right now you know it was God who came and pulled you out. The shout this morning is that God saw you about to, about to hang up your life and he called you so he could give you a good life. Don't stop right there. Somebody ought to think about it. If it had not been for God, where would you be right now? What would have happened at last trial you were in? How could you have made it through if it hadn't been for God? Every one of us here know we owe a debt that we cannot pay to the Lord because here's what God saw. He saw me smoking. He saw me drinking. He saw me trusting people. He saw me trying to love the world. And he said, that's my child. I'm not going to let you go out that way. And he pulled me into his kingdom. Here is what God did. I don't believe it was an accident. He called Peter and got in Peter's boat because he had an assignment for Peter. So can I leave off by telling you, here's what shallow people don't understand. Even though you're shallow. Even though your life is in shallow water, what you ought to be glad about is if God's still using you, uh huh. that means you still have a future. That means the devil really doesn't have you. That means that God has a miracle still way. Oh, come on, wake up somebody. You got to get to the point where you say, I'm getting out of this shallow water. I want everything God has. But shallow people need to understand that God didn't choose you to go under. Quit walking around so that you could rise up. And every time you get down, God is just waiting for you to reach out and he brings that super abundance. So the first thing to say about shallow people is God chose me even though I was shallow and he wanted to get me out of pitfalls, but if I don't trust him, I can't change. What am I saying? Shallow people don't like change and they don't like to be challenged. Ooh, I'm getting very metal right now. Shallow people, the reason they don't like direct preaching and they don't like people telling them stuff is because they've gotten to the point where in, uh, in the sentiments of old folk, can't nobody tell you nothing. Even Jesus. Jesus said if you would just listen, but your life is so shallow, you think you know everything. That's why you a fisherman hanging up your, your nets or washing your net. You said, well that's over. So I don't you don't you don't know God is trying to bring a new thing in your life. And you're sitting there not accepting the challenge and the change. Let me tell you why shallow Christians don't want to be challenged because they don't want to change. What does that mean? They do not want to take a good look at themselves. It's easier to look at what's going on in somebody else's life. But God, everything in God's word challenges us so that we can change and be better. And so what happens to a shallow folk? They don't want to change because they just ignore the challenges of God and they serve God placed on their time schedule. God, I'll give you this, but I won't give you this. God, I'll serve you here, but I won't serve you here. And God is saying you're not meeting the challenge and you're wondering why there's no blessing because you have not accepted the challenge because you don't want to change. The work is designed to change you. If you see anybody who has made it, it is because we have figured out challenges are just an opportunity 
for me to see the power of my God working. I need to challenge somebody right now. If you're going through the worst time in your life, I dare you, I double dare you to just lift your hand and say, this challenge should not have come to my door because I'm getting ready to release my faith in God. And God is going to come down and show me that where I thought was the end, he's just getting started to bless my life. So those of us who accept the challenges will tell you it's because there was some trouble and I accepted it and God blessed me. It's because I went through this that I can tell you God is able. It's because things look bad but I didn't give up that I can tell you God is a God who has more than enough power to bring me through. Somebody want to sit back and say, well I want God to fix this. God said, no, you got to hang in there through the trouble and if you do, I will show you that I'm a God who can bless you and bring you through. I remember going to the hospital to see this lady I need you to hear this because this was a very uh, crazy time for me. I walked in, and when I walked in to pray, I was a chaplain at the hospital. This woman was sitting there, and she was she was dying. Hospice was coming in to see her. She was dying, but every now and then she'd break out crying. She was dying, but she was crying. And I remember I sat there for a while, and I saw there was a time where I could break in, and I said, let me pray for you. And I was just about to pray, and she looked up in a very quiet voice and said, uh, 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 Reverend, before you pray, um, I need to tell you something, because I don't know if God will hear the prayer you get ready to pray for me. I, I said, well, what are you talking about? She said, because of what I did. I said, what did you do? She said, well, I've been hurting for a long time, and I finally decided to go to the doctor's. And when I got to the doctors, the doctor confirmed that it was cancer. So I went on and I started taking treatments and I even started going to church and to Bible study and I was doing all these things, but I missed my life. This thing turned my life upside down. So I decided that uh, I was just going to quit. I just stopped going. I felt a little better. I just stopped going. I like to play cards, and I like to go to bingo, and I like to go to vacation. So I just said, I'm taking my life back. For a while, it looked like everything was okay. But then, while I was on vacation, right in the middle, the cancer came back with a vengeance. My children had tried to talk to me to finish my treatments. The church folks was calling, saying, don't give up on God, but I just... Gave up on both of them, and I decided I'm going back and live my life the way I want. And she said, now I'm dying. Do you think God can still help me? I, I was intrigued by her story, so I, I just wanted to tell her that when she, gave, when, she, when she especially told me what her doctor said, she said the doctor said to her, uh, all you had to do was finish these treatments and make a few changes in your life. And you might have beat this thing, or at least lived longer. And she said, that's why I'm telling you. I don't know if God will hear me, because I didn't do that. All I had to do was change. Those words rang out in the hospital room. All I had to do was change. God told me to tell somebody right now, you got too many problems not to change. You got too many problems not to accept your challenge. You got too many problems when God is saying, I want to bless you, but you got to stop being shallow and accept the challenge and make sure that you change. You need to understand, when God, shallow people need to, like, like to quit when things get tough. In other words, too, uh, I, I like this. It said they were washing their nets. They were about to give up. And I told you that God had chose them, and that's why they needed to claim their blessing. Um, but they need to understand that when God chooses us, He hands us out something that we can grab at that moment. And if we don't grab it at that moment, we may not be blessed. Think about the woman at the well. Yeah, you still can, uh, you know, you still look good enough. You know, live with five men, had five husbands, now you live with another man. You still look good enough for somebody want to shack up with you. But that's not what I have for you. But you got to set the challenge of the word and change and claim your blessing. Please don't come to church not ready to let God give you a better future. Let's look at point two, the possibility of an abundant life. Verse four. Now when he left speaking, he said to Simon, launch out 
into the deep and let down your nets for a drought. Not only does God have a future for you, but God's future is based upon you having a super abundance and over abundance of things you need, power, strength, blessing, whatever you need from God is in your future because God said, I need you to not be shallow. I need you to launch out into the deep. Launching out into the deep means I need you to go to the deep. Now look, the deep is not a place, um, an easy place. I, I can't fool you. The, uh, the deep is going to have some dark nights. The deep is going to have some crazy mornings. The deep is going to have some struggles that you can't get through. The deep times are going to be moments when you don't know where you're coming or going. But it's also the only place to get real blessings is when you're in the deep. you got to realize that God blesses us while we're in the deep. And Christians who want the superabundance aren't like shallow folk. We just go run away and give up when things are not going the way we want them to go. So you got to learn how to launch out into the deep. The deep place is not a place for quitters. We talked about that. But some people want to give up. But in the deep, we learn that we cannot give up. When you're in the deep, you got to trust God no matter what's going on in your life. Come on, listen to me. Remember Job? He was sitting in the worst situation in his life. And his wife came to him and said, you ought to curse your God and die. And Job looked at her and said, you must have bumped your head. You want me to give up on a God who has blessed me, God has given, and God takes away. But when I look at it, God has given far more than he's taken away. So I'm going to continue to trust him. It's like when uh, King Nebuchadnezzar wanted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to quit, to bow down. Quit serving God and bow down and serve me. You know, the enemy's always trying to get you to bow down and serve him and not serve God. He'll tell you stuff that makes you think, oh, it's far better to do this. You'll get a little bit of relief. But he knows that if you bow down, if you quit, you'll never touch and release the power that God has for you in your life. Remember? And they said to him, no, we have the best reason in the world not to bow King Nebuchadnezzar. Know why? Because our God is able. Even if he doesn't do it, I know he's able. He, I, one of the reasons we don't give up because we have a God who's able. Can I tell you this morning that you need to understand, maybe you haven't gotten it yet, but if you have, hang on to able. He said, my God will get the blessing that you need in your life. He said, no, nah, we're not giving up because my God is able even if he doesn't. Watch this part. He said, I believe whatever he does have for me is better than what I would get if I gave up and quit. Those of us who get blessings never, ever quit. Why don't you quit? Because things are going good? No. Why don't you quit? Because every day is a good day? No. Why don't you quit? Because it looks like you will have an easy road? No. The reason we don't quit is because we signed on to a God who we have seen do miraculous things in our life. Amen, somebody. There was a little boy who was skating, brought him a, a, a nice pair of ice skates, and he was out there ice skating, and he had fallen down so many times that his face was bleeding and the tears and the blood was going into the cuts on his face and he fell down one more time, fell on his face and this man went and picked this little boy up, saw him and he said, look son, why don't you give up before you kill you, why don't you quit before you kill yourself? The little boy looked at him with an attitude and anger and said, mister, I did not buy these skates so I could quit. I bought these skates so I could learn how to skate. And I'm not going to quit till I skate. Somebody ought to hear the attitude that young boy say, I'm not going to quit. I did not choose Jesus so I could go back to the same mess I was dealing with. I did not choose God so that I could walk around without strength. I chose God because I believe and I've seen and I've trusted him and I know he brought me this far to continue to bless me. Those of us who are in the deep are not there because of good days. We dare because we refuse to quit on a God who has been this good. Here's the verse everybody's been waiting for. Simon said, Master, I told all night. Jesus, I'm a fisherman. My whole family fishing. We've been fishing. You a preacher. 
you preach, let me fish. And he told him, he said, no, I need you to understand that you have to trust the word of God. And Peter said something that blessed him. He said, nevertheless, at your word, I will. God, did you hear that? He said, here's what you find out from Peter when you read the text. The context is, Peter did not believe anything was going to happen. You know how you come to church and really don't believe? You just go through the motions because you've been going through the motions. But you don't think God's going to do that extra special thing. So Peter just said, nevertheless, I'll do it at your word. All I'm saying to you is every believer better to get to a nevertheless moment. You're going to have a moment in your mind where God is going to challenge you. And you know what? It's not going to make no sense. You're going to think about it. God, I don't even know you know what you're talking about. Nevertheless, at your word, I will do it. Now, if you move through this text, it says that when they did it, they had an overflow of fish. So much so that they had to call other people to help them load up the blessing. Matter of fact, it was a dream come true. Stop. It was a dream come true. What are you talking about? Peter had been wishing with all his talent that he could have caught as many fish as he caught when he, when he listened to God. All I'm saying to you is when Didn't work last time. God knows how to make a new way. 
All I'm telling you is, right now, today, he wanted me to give you a word as you're going through your trouble. He said, okay, doctor said no, phone's ran out, things are bad, but I'm just getting started. God bless you. This is Pastor Duncan. Please go to our website, share this message, give to the ministry. Our ministry is trying to do the things God has asked us to do. You need to go on and check it yourself and see what we're doing. But I need you to know this morning as we close, the power in this word is whenever you think it's over, remember, God is just Okay. Sorry. I was down, but with the no way up, and I needed some help. Everybody breathing, but not living, just existing. Well, and I needed some help. Jesus will set you free. 